בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We are uh, back here doing our שיעורים, ברוך השם. Uh, we're going to continue our uh, series of uh, the Geret Agra. The, uh, Zot Hashem. Uh, tonight, uh, שיעור is a big uh, uh, מזל טוב to a couple of very uh, wonderful תלמידים that ברוך השם had a, uh, a baby. Uh, so, Zot Hashem, this uh, uh, שיעור will be for the... Uh, Gafwa Shlema of both the uh, the the mom uh, Liora but uh, Liel uh, and also uh, the Tinoket uh, but uh, Liora uh, and also for that Slacha Raba of of the father Moshe. Kosh Bochui Vachot and Bekol Mikol Kol Chaim Rokim Shlemi Milim Torah Mitzvot Kminut Chasadim and uh, may they uh, raise up uh, Nachat Bezot Hashem. And also the uh, shiur before Refua Shlema for Rabbanit uh, Levana, Bat Sarah, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah, Bat Anat, Avim Ori David Ben Esriya, Doris Bat Jora, Orit Bat Ilana. Uh, and also for Atzlacha Rabba of Marsha Bat Julie, Ayla Bat Marsha, Samuel Ben Marsha, Sephas Ben Marsha, Alexander Ben Marsha, Louis Ben Marsha, Shaul Ben Farzane, Itro Ben Avraham, Amir Ben Shahin, Oshri ben Doris, Gabi ben Doris, Elad ben Doris, and all of Am Yisrael and all of the righteous Noahides that continue to learn Torah, to do the will of Hashem to the best of their abilities. Each and every day is a new battle. Each and every day, Baruch Hashem, is another success. So we have, uh, Baruch Hashem, the um, uh, good news that the uh, movie came out today, uh, worked on it for two and a half years. Um, the uh this perhaps was uh i would say uh uh the most difficult movie to put together i think uh we've had at least uh relatively speaking because it's a relatively short movie in comparison to some of the others but uh, a lot of difficulties to get to this point Baruch Hashem, we launched it today anyone that hasn't watched it uh, you're missing out uh, highly recommend to watch it as soon as possible uh, not right the second since you're watching a shiur, but after the shiur, I highly recommend you watch the shiur, uh, the uh, movie, The Signature of God. Uh, we um, had an amazing, amazing teamwork where Team Hashem really delivered uh, launching this uh, film with uh, nine different languages, nine different languages, Baruch Hashem. So regardless of whether you're uh, uh, English, Hebrew, French, German, Portuguese, Indonesian, uh, uh, what else? Spanish, uh, Russian, Turkish. Uh, Hashem, you uh, you have uh, you have the information ready for you, and uh, the movie Baruch Hashem has gotten some great uh, feedback from a lot of people that uh, send messages uh, that this was very very good. One person already told me, "Can you make it into a series?" <laughs> uh, I wish it was that simple. I wish it was that simple, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem, we'll continue. We'll continue to do whatever we can to work with our dear friend. Uh, the uh, uh, Yosef Sebag, Hashem Yivarech Oto, Ve'et Kol Mishpachto, Ve'kol Mikol Kol, and Bezot uh, Hashem will uh, continue to uh, do what we can. Uh, so with that being said, we have uh, the uh, update on uh, the event. The event is uh, scheduled for later this month. I know that a bunch of you have already RSVP'd. Anyone that hasn't RSVP'd, we have an event coming up here in South Florida in uh, three weeks from now. Uh, Anyone that wants to uh, attend, it's free, uh, and there's a lot of uh, free goodies that uh, we give out at the events. Uh, Baruch Hashem, the uh, the first event uh, cost close to twenty thousand dollars between the uh, the place, the the all the stuff, and uh, that we gave away. So uh, you know this this event, uh, I would say, is probably going to be uh, not too cheap either. So anyone that wants to help us uh, and sponsor the event partially or fully. Uh, is welcome to do it. We have a, uh, a new website, a new uh, sponsorship section that's, um, you know, that's on the site for, uh, specifically for these events. If you want to uh, uh, sponsor these weekly lectures, uh, that's also obviously welcome. Uh, you know, whether I do a lecture in uh, my house or I do a lecture in uh, you know, a major place with you know, a few hundred people, there's still a huge uh, overhead uh, to pay for the dozens of employees that we have, uh, the uh, the technology costs, and you know, it's Baruch Hashem, uh, a uh, you know, I think overhead uh, is over a hundred thousand dollars a month, 
uh, at this point between the kolels and everything else. So, Baruch Hashem, we need as many sponsors as possible uh, that uh, could join us in everything that we're doing. And this is not, uh, you know, uh, paying for the future yeshiva. The future yeshiva obviously is separate, which uh, we're actually, uh, you know, looking actively uh, at places. Baruch Hashem, we saw a few um, in the last few days. Bezat Hashem, we'll keep you guys posted if anything develops out of it. Uh, lastly, the Kiruv store, anyone that uh, hasn't uh, ordered Rabbi Ephraim's uh, new book, uh, we, uh, we, we still have some left. It's Obviously, it's in Hebrew, but if you have Hebrew-speaking community, get yourself a uh, 14 books for free. We even pay for the shipping. Just go to kiruvstore.org and we'll send you the, uh, the books. We also have uh, the... Um, Shovavim package for Tikkun Abrit. We have the USBs, uh, 10 USBs and 10 uh, uh, books about uh, Tikkun Abrit, about wasting seed and uh, the different sources from the Torah uh, that discuss uh, why it's forbidden and how to stop and so on. So uh, the, the famous book called Holy Nation and also a couple of uh, the uh, Kiruv cards uh, for the Tikkun Abrit movie. That package is also in the store. Baruch Hashem, a lot of people have already uh, gotten them and ordered them. Uh, for anyone that hasn't, this is uh, each package of the Shovavim is more expensive than the others because of the USB. So we're talking about something like each one is about $600 uh, worth of merchandise. So again, anyone that wants to uh, uh, get it for free is welcome to if you live in the United States. If you live in uh, you know somewhere outside of the U.S., we're not shipping there at this point. Um, but uh, anyone that's living in the U.S. is welcome to uh, uh, to order it, uh, and also, of course, anyone that wants to sponsor uh, the uh, regular package is about two hundred fifty dollars uh, average. Some of them are more, some are less, depending on how much stuff people buy uh, or order. Uh, some people order everything we have in the store, which is, uh, uh, you know, over a thousand dollars. And some people order just a couple of things. So we average it out in the beginning. It was a few hundred dollars per package. But if somebody orders the Shovavim package, if the cost is higher, but nonetheless, it's all free. Uh, so you go to kiruvstore.org and order yourself a package. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Baruch Hashem, we have a, uh, a lot of work, a lot of uh, things to, uh, to discuss. Uh, the uh, the Gomi Vilna has been, uh, you know, guiding us alongside with the Chazonish. And the two series is, as if you noticed, uh, the two Chachamim are uh, very much in sync, uh, you know, with, with really not just their, uh, their, their Minhagim and so on, but also their Ashkafa is identical uh, and uh, each book feeds off of the other. Each series feeds off of the other. While the Chazonish uh, has taught us about Emunah, Bitachon, uh, the necessity to learn Alacha and Musar, uh, the, uh, the Gomi Vilna had actually taught us the, uh, the Musar itself, uh, warned us about certain uh, uh, punishments, severe punishments of Kafakela uh, for, uh, for idle speech and, and, and worst actions. And uh, gave us a few insights of certain things to stay away from. So now, the Gomi Vilna continues with, uh, with the Igeret Agra, uh, a letter to his family, needless to say, uh, to us. Uh, and uh, this is at a time where we have uh, Parashat Truma, this week's Parashat Truma, uh, Veikhuli Truma. Uh, Chachamim say, why does it say Veikhuli Truma? Why does it say that they should take for me? A, uh, a uh, donation, uh, a portion, it should say that they should uh, really uh, give, not take. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, one thing is that if a person is giving, uh, the uh, Chachamim teach that uh, uh, the uh, tree of life uh, uh, is uh, for those that uh, uphold it and uh, those that uh, invest in the tree of life, those that invest in the Torah, those that invest in Torah scholars, uh, they're the ones that actually end up uh, being the uh, praiseworthy uh, not and the biggest beneficiary of it, uh, not because the uh, Torah scholar doesn't appreciate it, but rather because the Torah and the Torah scholar are going to get what they need to get with or without us. Uh, when we invest into the Torah, when we invest to help people do tshuva, when we invest into the kolel and the yeshiva and so on, in essence, what we're doing is we're investing into our own olamaba. 
uh, we're uh, telling Hashem that we want to be a vessel for uh, for Him to bring His salvation to the world. So in essence, we are the ones that are praiseworthy because we benefit and because we chose the right way. Uh, because as far as Him giving and feeding people, He'll do it with or without us. He doesn't need us uh, for anything, but when we choose for Him to use us as a vessel to bring more Torah to the world, that makes a person more praiseworthy. So uh, when a uh, person actually is uh, giving a tuma, giving a portion, giving tzedakah, the uh, Torah says, Vikhuli, Vikhu, they're really taking. They're taking for me. They're taking uh, merits for themselves. And uh, also, the, uh, I heard a chidush from uh, Arav Meir Eliyahu that uh, I believe it was a, uh, in the name of one of the Kabbalists in the previous generation, that, uh, you know, when he says, Vikhuli Truma, that they take for me a Truma, uh, they take for me a portion instead of give, it's because they take this Truma, they take these, uh, these uh, merits uh, with them. This is the only thing they take with them to Allah Abba, because you can't take your house, you can't take your car, you can't take anything. The only thing you can take is, uh, is the merits that you have, the Torah that you have, is that's the only thing that you can actually uh, take with you. So... There is another thing that I, Bisiyat uh, Dishmaya, got uh, from it uh, as, as part of uh, Baruch Hashem uh, learning, uh, is that uh, really one of the things that Akadosh uh, Baruch uh, requires from us time and time again, as we saw from uh, uh, before He allowed us to leave Egypt, Akadosh uh, Baruch uh, put all of the plagues on the Egyptians, but before the final plague, before He officially allowed us. To leave Egypt, he told uh, Moshe Rabbeinu that he wants each and every one of the uh, Jewish people to uh, take the uh, uh, um, the uh, take a korban, uh, take one of the uh, um, idols of the uh, of the Egyptians, uh, which was the goat, and uh, tie it to the beds, leave them there, tie it to the bed for a few days, and let them scream so the Egyptians can hear it and come and ask, "What are you doing with my God?" And then make sure that all of Bnei Israel say to the Egyptians, Oh, that your God, yeah, we're about to slaughter him in a couple of days. When God tells us to, we're going to slaughter him. We're going to slaughter your God. So when, when, the, uh, when Moshe heard this, he says the, you know, to Hashem, Hashem, they're, they're, they've been slaves for, 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 for over a century. They, they, we've been tortured. They're scared to death of the Egyptians. Now you're going to tell them to go and uh, uh, taunt the Egyptians, taunt the idol worshippers? They're scared. Hashem says, I swear on my name. I swear on my name that if they do not do this, I'm not letting them out of Egypt. Meaning that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that in order for us to be righteous Jews, in order for us to be the so-called chosen people, there is a prerequisite of Mesirut Nefesh, of self-sacrifice. And as time and time again that we saw it, after after this event of course we saw it with Avraham, Yitzhak and Yaakov that they had constant sacrifices in each one of the tests that they had to overcome that were unbearable to any normal human beings they overcame them and became the uh, the uh, uh, the patriarchs uh, of course the the matriarchs did the same thing overcame their own obstacles and this is a prerequisite to be a righteous person now Am Yisrael got to Yam Suf and Hashem says Move forward. Stop crying to me. Move forward. Take us, you know, do something about it. What do you mean? Uh, I'm crying to you so you help me. This is not the time to cry. This is the time to move forward. And of course, Nachshon ben Aminadav, Nachshon, Nachshon the son of Aminadav from the tribe of Yehuda, went into the water and sacrificed everything. And because of his merit, Am Yisrael had the, uh, the sea split for them. But the uh, Chachamim say that the sea did not split all at once like we think because we saw movies in the past, Hashem Yishmol V'yatzil. But rather, we, the, the sea split a little bit at a time. We took a few more steps, it split a little more. We took a few more steps, it split a little bit more. Why? Chachamim say to symbolize to us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not going to give us all of the salvation and all of the salvations in, in one shot. And He's not going to give us even a single salvation all at one shot. Why? He wants to continue sacrifice, continue move forward without knowing what the future entails, without knowing how it's all going to work out. He wants to see you continue dedicating yourself. So, Vikhuli Tumah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us, they take from me a portion. I want them to take 
their lives. They want a portion of my Allah Abba. They have to take their lives into their own hands and sacrifice everything. Take everything you have and sacrifice it for the sake of a Kadosh Baruch Hu and you're only going to get uh, Hashem and everything else. So the point being is, is that when a person thinks of sacrifice, they think, oh yeah, well, I'll, I could do that once in a blue moon, maybe once in my life, and that's okay. When it, we see what the Chachamim write, we see that really a, a, a righteous life is a life of sacrifice. And whether we want to sacrifice or not, we have to deal with difficulties. The question is whether we're going to choose our difficulties or we're going to have Hashem choose those difficulties for us. Meaning, when you make a sacrifice, that's in essence you choosing that difficulty. You're saying, Hashem, you already de- decreed for me to get 100 pounds of difficulty this year. I'm going to take it. So I know 100 pounds, whether way or another, I'm going to get 100 pounds of difficulty. So you know what? I'm going to sacrifice it by studying 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 15 hours a day of Torah, donating whatever I can for the sake of Torah, donate time, donate money, donate resources, donate whatever I can, help as many people as I possibly can. So I'm going to donate all of what I can for the sake of your Torah, all of my energy. So when a person is making that extra, you know, not just what he can, the bare minimum, but the extra, he pushes themselves, she pushes herself, extra Hashem says oh I decreed for you to have a hundred pounds of difficulty that extra push ended up being a hundred pounds of difficulty therefore I'm not going to give you a different difficulty such as financial problems marriage problems this problem that problem corona problems and that's what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says in the, in the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot that a, a person that takes on themselves the burden of the Torah HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes away from them the burden of the of the world so in essence the burden comes one way or the other question is whether you're going to choose it or not and of course it's easier said than done and that's what we want to learn how do we actually get to that point of having that mindset where we're going to continuously be able to choose the right thing where we're going to continuously choose the burden rather than have Hashem be forced in essence because of his own loss for himself to choose the burden for us so the uh, Gaon Vilna is going to help us Be'ezrat Hashem and he says the following so he says to his family and among my books there is a copy of Mishle Proverbs with the Ashkenazi translation Ashkenazi meaning Yiddish for the sake of Hashem have them read daily we're gonna understand in a moment what does it mean for the sake of Hashem have them read daily it's the best of all of the Musar books and also the book of Kohelet should also be read continuously before you because it's note it notes the vanity of this world and there are other similar books that should be read as well so here the Gaon Mi Vilna gives specific instructions of how to be able to make the right choices daily and it starts with learning Musal now for those of you that think that learning Musal for those of you that think that learning Musal is perhaps a suggestion or a Midat Chasidut a uh, trade uh, you know something like that in fact it is Allah now we already know that Rabbi Yosef Karo himself in his Magid Mesharim Sefer he himself wrote about his conversations with his Chavuta that was an angel that uh, he got rebuked for only studying only three hours of Musar or, or, or less and he got rebuked and one time he didn't study Musar and uh, the rebuke was that when he put on his tefillin uh, suddenly his tefillin of his head broke and it fell on the floor and Rabbi Yosef Karo, that was Kodesh Kodeshim, cried hysterically, how could this happen to me? Not how could the uh, tefillin break, but how could it be that I have such a terrible uh, spiritual uh, condition that Hashem allows my tefillin to fall on the floor? How could it be? And Rabbi Yosef Karo cried hysterically, and when the, when the Magid Mesharim, when the, uh, the, the Malach, the angel, came to him and says, your tefillin fell, didn't they? And uh, of course, Rabbi Yosef Karo answered the affirmative. And he says, you know why, right? He says, no, I don't know. I've been crying about it. Do you know? He said, yeah, I did it. 
You, you come my tefillin? He goes, yeah, I cut your tefillin. Why did you come my tefillin? He says, because you didn't learn Musar. That's why I cut your tefillin. When you didn't learn Musar, you already went down spiritually. I had to get your attention before it got too far. Imagine this. Rabbi Yosef Karo, the, the, the father of Allah for, for all of Klal Israel today that, that follow Torah and Mitzvot, we follow Shukhan Aruch. Kodesh Kodeshim was praying his whole life to Hashem to kill him on Kiddush Hashem. I mean, this is one of his prayers. People today are praying for a third house. People today are praying for a, uh, you know, more money, more this, more, 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 more. What does Rabbi Yosef Karo pray for his whole life? He prayed to die on Kiddush Hashem, that somebody kills him uh, because he's a Jew. That's what he prayed for. So imagine such a holy person. His, the angel is telling him, you didn't learn Musa one day. You already went down spiritually. I had to get your attention before it goes too far. If he missed the day of learning Musa and already the angel is at a point where he's telling him before it goes too far, I had to get your attention and do something so severe what about us that we didn't learn Musa? Not today, not yesterday, not this last week, not the week before, not in the last five years, not the last 20 years, not a whole life, and some people don't even know what Musa is. What about... Unfortunately, one of the things that I see over the last seven, eight years of, of speaking and, and, and dealing with the public and helping people do tshuva to the best of our abilities, all of course, is that there is a, uh, a sickness a sickness within the uh, the Torah world that uh, unfortunately I already knew from day one that it was in the uh, the uh, the Jewish world altogether. I mean, it's mentioned already in the Tanakh. It's not it's not a new thing that people run away from learning Musa. But uh, what surprised me was to see that people that actually got closer to Hashem as a result of learning Musa either. They were already frum, but they were already frum because they were like robots. You know, they grew up that way, and they just like a uh, African is uh, walking around in underwear in the middle of some jungle uh, and doesn't think there's anything wrong with it. They uh, go to a synagogue and pray, and they don't think there's anything wrong with it. You know, like they just do things more systematically, and not 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 much neshama there. So after learning Musa, Baruch Hashem, they get closer to Hashem. Their prayer have much more kavana. They want to learn more. They do learn more. And Baruch Hashem stop sinning the big sins. So a lot of from people from different communities all over the world, you know, used our shulim to get closer to Hashem. And of course, people that were secular, uh, that, uh, you know, abandoned all of the, uh, the filth of this world to become B'nai Torah, to learn Torah. Baruch Hashem, last year we had four people complete the shas. Uh, you know, we have uh, quite a few people that are learning the Shash, learning a lot of things, going to Yeshivot. Uh, a couple of people have already become uh, uh, speakers or rabbis. So, Baruch Hashem, a lot of success. But one of the things that really uh, breaks my heart is when I see that one of these Baalet Shuva, one of these Baalet Shuva that really got on the right path because of Musa, decides to abandon Musa, but not on purpose, not because I don't like it, Rabbi. I just don't have time for it anymore. I'm going to learn some Gemara. I'm going to learn some Shukhan Aruch. I'm going to learn with this. I'm going to learn with that. Uh, you know, I'll read a book once in a while. And uh, there's nothing more, more, more saddening than that. Why? Because you already know that this person's on the wrong path again. It's just not the same wrong path as the past. It's a different wrong path. What is this wrong path? It's called Gava. It's called arrogance. That's the path. And toivat Hashem kol the, the uh, people that are arrogant are disgusting in the eyes of Hashem. Now, of course, you don't want to tell people, listen, it's disgusting what you're doing. So you try to guide them. You try to tell them, listen, you know, you need to learn more Musa. You need to do this. You need to do that. Most of the time it works, but sometimes to no avail. Sometimes you can tell a person, listen, you need to make sure that that same Musa that got you on the right path keeps you on the path. Meaning if you learned an hour in the past, uh, to to get you to where you are, you have to continue staying learning an hour. You don't ever graduate from learning Musa. You always have to learn Musa. In fact, the more connected you are to Akadosh Baruch Hu, the more you have to learn, not the less. If Rabbi Yosef Kao had to learn three hours a day of Musa, what about us? So a person that's delusional thinks that just because they keep Shabbat and they don't kill people anymore, they think that they don't need to learn Musa anymore. Unfortunately, that's a bad path. And it happens. It happens uh, uh, more often than I would like for it to happen. But nonetheless, it does happen. And 
what the Gaon Mivilna is telling us here is that learning Musal is not only critical, not only critical, but it's Pikuach Nefesh. It's literally Pikuach Nefesh, uh, the, the spiritual Nefesh. It's a life risk for your Neshama because without learning Musal, a person is not going to know if he is making the right decision or not. And needless to say, he's not going to know whether he's uh, going in the right path or not. Uh, and whether he's gonna make whether he's gonna make that sacrifice that is expected from him from Shemaim or not. And in fact, the Chafetz uh, Chaim, uh, Chafetz Chaim writes it in the Mishnah Bura as an alacha in the uh, first Siman in alacha uh, uh, number twelve. He writes the following: It's necessary for a person to establish set daily times or set times daily. For learning Musa, whether for a lengthy or a brief time, because the greater a person may be, his inclination to sin is that much greater. And the only antidote for the Yetzirah is the Torah words of Chazal, meaning Musa. Now, how does the Chafetz uh, Chaim determine that the Torah words of the sages? Our, uh, our Musal, why can't uh, the Torah words of the sages be well, perhaps a lacha that they teach? Why does it have to be Musal? In the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 32b, the Gemara brings a uh, teachings, a rebuke. It says the rabbi is taught in the Berita that uh, that uh, for the sin of uh, unfulfilled vows, a person's children die. Shemishmo. These are the words of Rabbi Lazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And Rabbi Uda, Anasi, Rabbi Akadosh, says, Ba'avon bitul Torah, children die. That for the uh, because uh, the uh, the parents of these children neglect Torah, the neglect Torah study, their children die. Shemishmo. And then the Gemara continues and says, now according to to the one of the Chachamim that says that the children die because of the sin of unfulfilled vows, the re- the reason is understandable. Because the uh, the source for this as is, uh, is what we know that. Uh, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 5 where uh, where it says that uh, where it says that the, uh, this is a uh, the, uh, the Pasuk says teaches us that there is a risk here for a person that doesn't deliver doesn't deliver what they say they're going to deliver there's a promise in the Torah there's a promise in the Torah that such a thing will happen. But what about the uh, neglecting of Torah? Where, where, where do we get this? Where do we get this? That uh, it's written. It's written in the uh, prophet Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 20. That uh, in vain I have smitten your children. And they have not accepted the, uh, the Musa, the rebuke. So the Chachamim say, okay, but it says Musa. The Chachamim say, ah, yeah, exactly. Musa means neglected Torah study. Musa says neglected Torah. So Rashi in the Marsha says that the word Musa and the word Torah are synonymous. They mean the same thing. Same thing. It's not that Musa is a part of the Torah, but rather Musa is Torah. Musa is Torah. So says the Mishnah Bua, Chafetz Chaim again, in another place in the Mishnah Bua, in section 6, 673, uh, second halacha, in the name of the Arizal, where the, uh, the Mishnah Bua says that the Arizal even said that there's an obligation to study Musa works every day. And so did the Gaon Mivilna in many places in his commentary on Mishle and Maserav. So this is not the you know, this this uh, this letter is not the only place 
that the Gaon Mivilna, the Gra, uh, said that you have to learn Musa, but he also mentioned it in his other place, other works, commentary on, on uh, Mishlen and Maserav, and so on. And the Chafetz Chaim also writes that while a person may think that their obligation, that this, that this obligation to learn Musa is not really relevant to people that spend their entire time or a lot of time toiling in Torah, it's quite the opposite. Because the greater a person may be, his inclination to sin becomes even greater. So in essence, meaning that because he became greater or she became greater because they're learning more Torah and doing more things and they're excellent in doing mitzvot, there's actually an increase in requirement for them to learn to learn Musa. In fact, this is also in the Gemara. The Gemara in Masechet uh, Sukkah uh, says that in uh, page 54, I believe, says that the, uh, the, the greater a person, the greater is Yetzara. And Arav Gershon Erlstein says also in another, a, uh, another uh, commentary on this uh, subject, where he says that the way for a person to strengthen their resolve for greatness is through learning Musal. And this is not a midat chasidut, or, you know, meaning exercising extreme piety, but rather it's a straightforward obligation, says Rav Elistin. Personal growth is completely dependent on daily Musar studies. Even during the week of Ben Azmani, which is the uh, in-between semesters for Yeshiva Bachurim, or Kolel, Meaning learning Musa is not something that you can ever take a break on. There's no every single day of the year, including Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur. A person needs to learn some Musa, some more, some less, but nonetheless, as much as possible. Now, one thing I noticed about Rav Gershon Elistin's comment is that he says that the, uh, to strengthen a person's resolve for greatness. And I had a thought, well, why does a person have to strengthen their resolve for greatness? And in essence, what Musa does is two things. It's two things in regards to a person's resolve for greatness. Now you can look at it, a resolve for greatness to mean the basic meaning, which is that people can achieve greatness. Can achieve greatness because you have a special neshama that HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself put himself into you. And you have the ability to become great. You have the ability to reach your full potential. Of course, no one's going to become Moshe Rabbeinu. No one's going to become Avraham Avinu. No one's going to become Rabbi Zusha. No one's going to become Rabbi Akiva. But you can become the best you. And that's what Rabbi Zusha, Rabbi Zusha Minapoli, one of the uh, Talmidim of the Talmidim of the Baal Shem Tov, says that he, he cried one day and they asked him, Rabbi, why are you crying? He says, because I know that in Shemaim, they're not going to ask me why I wasn't Moshe Rabbeinu and why I wasn't Rabbi Akiva. They're going to ask me, Zusha, Zusha. How come you didn't get to a point of being Zusha? Meaning, how come I didn't fulfill my full potential? So the point is, a person has the ability to reach greatness. Male or female, Jew or Gentile, Eliyahu Hanavi even testifies to this. That whether male or female, Jew or Gentile, uh, young, old, poor, rich, everybody has the ability to get to a level of Ruach HaKodesh. So a person can reach true greatness. So Rav Edelstein says, on one hand, a person... To, for him to achieve this, uh, to, to strengthen his resolve for greatness, to, meaning to be more likely to reach his greatness, he has to learn Musa. And that's the basic words of the Chacham. But of course, we know the Chachamim don't talk simply. They also want you to delve into their words. Why? Because they have an endless amount of Torah. Why does he use resolve for greatness? Why do you say he can reach his potential? Because Rabotai Yekarim, Rav Edelstein knows that we have an obsession to reach greatness, but not greatness in Torah, greatness in money, greatness in reputation, greatness in fame, greatness in material. And for a person to strengthen is resolve for greatness, meaning for a person to strengthen himself so he stops being obsessed with getting more money stop being obsessed with becoming famous stop being obsessed with being liked by everyone even the reshaim stop being obsessed with attaining more material stop with this obsession that's not your point in the world in order for you to strengthen that resolve that addiction to greatness 
That's not greatness in Torah. You have to learn Musar. Why? Because that Musar is going to tell you that it's all Evel Avalim. It's all futile, futile, as Shlomo Melech says. It's all nonsense. You can't take any of this stuff with you. So while the Musar is going to make you realize that Money is the same thing as a hammer. It's a tool to use to get from one place to another, point A to point B. That's it. Don't make your whole life about it. If Hashem decides to give you money, He'll give you money. If He decides not to give you money, then say thank you because that's your test. But either way, a person needs to be stop being obsessed with becoming famous and becoming this and becoming that. Just be the best version of you. What's the best version of you? The best version of you can only be, be attained through Torah. How can you get it? By learning that very same Musa that is distancing you away from the addiction to material and bringing you closer to the addiction of Torah and servitude of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So here we see, Rabotai, that that resolve for greatness, that resolve from greatness has two aspects. And Musa is the cure for both. You get a twofer. You get a twofer. The Gaumi Vilna is not implying here that it's sufficient for a person to simply just read the uh, the words of the uh, Musa or listen to uh, Shiur or passively in the background while you're doing your business and that's enough. No. He's specifically mentioning examples. Although it's good to learn, you know, to have Musa in the background and listen and read as much as you can, even when you can't put your full capacity into it. But don't think that that's enough. You have to first and foremost make learning Musa part of your day-to-day uh, life. It has to become a habit, a good habit. We all have plenty of bad habits. We have to make some good habits too. Make learning Musa a certain amount of day from certain time to certain time uh as part of your life don't just learn musar on the days of the shoe don't just learn musar uh just when uh you you like the topic you have to learn every day and a person that uh just treats musai superficially unfortunately this happens also is not going to reach their full goal why because sometimes a person can be deluded deluded into believing that they know a lot more than they do and uh because they're not really delving into the subject so i'll give you an example the gaumi vilna is specifically mentioning two books two great extraordinary divinely inspired books proverbs and ecclesiastes both written by the wisest man of all time shlomo amelech why is he mentioning that? Why isn't he mentioning his own works? Why isn't he mentioning uh, anything else? Because anyone that wants to read Proverbs knows that you have to, in, in order to understand Proverbs, even though he speaks clearly, you have to delve into it. You have to toil. You have to figure out certain things. You have to read the commentary. You can't just read it plainly because just like we were able to uh, uh, get uh, more teachings from Arab Edelstein, one of the greats of this generation. Needless to say, we can get a lot more from a teachings of Shlomo Amelech from 3,000 years ago. So a person that uh, learns Proverbs, learns Ecclesiastes, learns anything from the 24 books of the Tanakh, knows that they have to put more effort into it. They can't just read it superficially. Unfortunately, many times there are people that learn bad habits. For example, there is a uh, uh, a teachings that the words of the Zohar Kadosh are holy enough that even if you don't understand them, it's still good for the Neshama to read a few words here and there. Now, it shouldn't become your uh, your Torah time, meaning if you only have an hour a day uh, to learn Torah, don't spend a uh, that hour, you know, just reading the Zohar without understanding. You know, don't learn Zohar at all. You have a lot of other things you have to learn uh, that are much more important than the Zohar. Even though the Zohar Kadosh is extremely important, it's, it's, it's not for everybody, especially not for somebody that learns only an hour a day. But the point being is that most people that read Zohar don't understand anything. There's a custom that's done where uh, be, uh, the uh, night before a Brit Milah, where you get a Minyan of kosher Jews that uh, come and each one learns a section of the Zohar 
Even if they don't understand it, they just simply read it. Each person reads a certain section of the Zohar. And that's the custom. It's, uh, it's done at the uh, house that the baby is uh, sleeping in. Uh, and uh, it's a uh, beautiful custom. You can't always achieve this. But nonetheless, it's a, uh, this custom is done even if people don't know what they're reading. Meaning they're reading the words, they're making the sounds, but they have no idea what they're saying. It's still okay to do it because there's a certain element of Kedusha of holiness that's produced by those words but that is never recommended by anybody of this or previous generation to become your main body of study because you have a lachic responsibility to learn musal to learn the weekly parasha twice with commentary once to learn a uh, alacha you have a lot of other things that take precedent over it and unfortunately many times people learn things and they don't really understand not because the material is not understandable but just because the language they read it in a let's say in hebrew but they don't really understand hebrew they know how to make the sounds so why are you reading it in hebrew if you don't understand what it says you have to understand what it says now although there's a certain a, a kedusha that's generated by reading the hebrew language it's much more important for a person to know what he's saying than 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 uh, than achieving that kedusha because that person can achieve that kedusha but then still be a mechalal shabbat still desecrate shabbat so he he won one and he lost a zillion you understand so a person needs to understand that the language itself is critical uh in a sense that a person has to know what he's learning he has to learn something that he knows what he's learning and uh one of the things one of the things that we see from uh shlomo Amelech is that he speaks clearly in his a uh, proverbs but there is more than meets the eye if you look at the commentary of his parables of his uh, different uh, statements that he makes there's a lot more than meets the eye that we learn from when we see what the what the sages that toiled their whole life what they got out of it what's arma so it now of course Shlomo Melech prayed for this this is not something that was uh Shlomo Melech uh, uh, got for no reason at 12 years old, when Shlomo Melech became a king, he saw that uh, you know, one of his brothers was uh, willing to even kill him, if need be, because he wanted the kinghood and cared less about what was the will of Hashem, cared less about what was the will of his father David. He wanted to uh, be the king. And uh, of course, Shlomo Melech knew that this he's going to be uh, watched with an eagle eye. From all of the people that disagree, all of the people that are enemies. And when he before he went to sleep, he asked Hashem, he prayed to Akadosh Baruch Hu to help him. And uh, he had a prophetic dream where Akadosh Baruch Hu came to him in a uh, in a dream and told him, My son, what do you want? What do you want? I'll give you whatever you want. And Shlomo Amelech says, I want to have the knowledge, meaning the Torah knowledge to judge your people righteously to judge your people according to your Torah HaKadosh Baruch Hu was so impressed with Shlomo HaMelech that he says because you chose my kids over yourself you could have chosen to be the strongest king ever you could have chosen to be the uh, uh, richest king you could have chosen a lot of other things but you chose to know my Torah I'm gonna to give you all of them this is actually in the book of Kings 1 chapter 3 verses 6 through 9 so Shlomo HaMelech has this dream then he gets this gift he wakes up out of this dream with immense knowledge he understands the language of the animals he understands uh, all types of things so he realizes this was not just uh, another dream and this Shlomo HaMelech in his lifetime he puts together three bodies of work that become part of the Tanakh and each one of them is there to t- it was written in a different part of his life and each one of them is there to teach us something else now the Ramban Nachmanides says that when Shlomo Melech says that uh, in Ecclesiastes no less than seven times that everything is evelavalim futile futiles he's not referring to there is a mistake in the uh in the creation 
uh, Shalom, that Hashem made a mistake, but rather that, that there's a mistake in people's actions, where instead of chasing Hashem and chasing His Torah and, and doing whatever they can to serve Hashem, they uh, miss the point and they try to serve themselves and their desires. So the, uh, the Ramban says that the uh, Shlomo Melech urges us to evaluate the world through Hashem's lenses and to recognize that anything that conflicts with the Torah's perspective has no value. And therefore, these three bodies of work, according to the Ramban, have three different purposes. The Song of Songs, which is a something that Shlomo Melech wrote to uh, show his a uh, uh, the beauty of the connection that a Kadosh Baruch Hu has with his people, like a husband and wife. Initially, when some people read this uh, uh, song of songs, they thought it was a provocative songs. But uh, Rabbi Akiva came and uh, told them, "No, no, no! This is not only not a provocative song. Out of all the songs that we have, they're all holy. But the song of songs." is holy of holies because this is talking about the intimate relationship between a kadosh baruch Hu and his people how much he loves us so the ramban says that the song of songs describes am israel's loving relationship with a kadosh baruch Hu and is therefore the holiest of the holy proverbs on the other hand is the sefer that the shlomo melech writes to lead the people to the ultimate goal of eternal life while ecclesiastes warns a person away from the road to futility and oblivion so of course we accept the words of the ramban no different than matan torah but of course if something doesn't contradict you could also have a uh, a uh, insight within an insight where proverbs is something that when a person looks at it immediately you understand that there is a message here ecclesiastes you you understand that there's a message there song of songs confused a lot of people why because they thought it's a song about a man and a woman mentions different body parts and so on so if a person doesn't understand what's actually being spoken about you actually would think this is a provocative song so in reality when i looked at it i figured that proverbs is a book that is there to teach you musal to teach you musal that's specific to putting you on the right direction ecclesiastes on the other hand is a book that's going to teach you Musar, but specifically focusing on scaring you from losing Olam Abba, meaning Yirat Shemaim. While the first two are amazing, step number three is really the big Chidush. Why? Because once a person has developed a character and softened in essence his character through the teachings of proverbs through the teachings of musaf and proverbs to be on the right path in order to develop the right amount of yirat shamayim that he needs that he would get by learning ecclesiastes then he can become the vessel that can begin to appreciate the song of songs for what it really is and fall in love with Hashem many people want to skip the first two they don't want to learn about fear of punishment they don't want to learn about fear of the Almighty they want to go jump straight to loving Hashem unfortunately it doesn't exist that does not exist there is no reality such as that now Shlomo HaMelech built the Bet HaMikdash in the most extraordinary way where the Chachamim say somebody didn't see 
the uh, Bet Migdash that Shlomo Amelech built never saw beauty. And the Arona Kodesh, the Arona Kodesh that was in the Bet Migdash that had the uh, Ten Commandments was made by Atse Shittim, Acacia Wood. And the Chachamim ask, why did Akadosh Baruch Hu decree in uh, the book of Exodus, chapter 25, verse 10 and 11, why did Akadosh Baruch Hu decree for the Arona Kodesh that's holding the covenant, that's holding the most important things that ever existed in the world? There was the man there, there was a uh, uh, the Sefer Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote, the, the staff uh, of Aaron Cohen. I mean, there's uh, Ten Commandments, both the broken ones and the ones that with uh, Bo Hashem, we get the second pair. So, also we see that this is a supernatural Aaron Kodesh where it has no space. He's not limited to space and time because the, these types of things wouldn't fit in such a Aaron Kodesh. It also didn't take up space, the Gemara says. Where if you do the measurements of the Kodesh Kodeshim, and you see, wait, we had and the, where the uh, Kohen Gadol would go, where it would stand, where it would be, you see, wait, it doesn't make sense that there's an Arona Kodesh in that spot, and there's still that much space between that and the wall. Meaning that the Arona Kodesh did not take up space in the world. So there's a lot of supernatural things, but yet this Arona Kodesh is made up of three boxes. Two golden ones and one acacia wood. So the Chachamim ask, why did Hakadosh Baruch Hu have us make this, uh, use this Arona Kodesh that has acacia wood in it? If you want it to be golden, have it golden. If you want it to be wood, have it wood. Why this and that? So one of the Chachamim says, well, it's also to teach us that a Jew has to be the same inside as he is outside he has to be gold inside the inner box was gold and outside he has to be gold but how everybody says yeah but i'm the same all time i never change if you don't learn musal to realize that you're really a piece of wood and you're in essence supposed to be a tool a tool a vessel that akadosh Baruch Hu uses in the world not a vessel that serves yourself all day and your desires all day then you're definitely not gold here or gold there maybe you're gold here and not there maybe gold there and not here but not in both a person needs to know that only through the torah can they be the same both inside and outside beautiful inside and beautiful outside there are many people that are beautiful outside disgusting inside some people are beautiful inside and disgusting outside nonetheless a person needs to be the same in both this is when people ask me, oh, can I learn from this? Can I continue to learn from my rabbi if he does this, this, and this? Gemaraan Masech and Moed Katan says, if his inside is the same as his outside, meaning he learns Torah and he applies it in his life, learn Torah from him. He, has a, he learns about good actions and he does good actions, learn from him. If he acts like an angel, meaning he's there to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu, learn from him. But if he acts like a, uh, maybe an angel, but the angel of death, He's Malach Chabalah. He, all he wants is to uh, kill or be killed mentality where he wants to do whatever he can just to get money from people and to get people to uh, uh, to like him and press likes on his uh, on his videos, even if that means inviting missionaries to the shul, even if that means idol, idol worship, even if that means being a criminal. You know, he does whatever just to get more fame. Obviously, you can't learn to love from such a person. He distorts the Torah. You can't learn to love from such a person. A person needs to know that the uh the arona kodesh was symbolic to teach us many many things but chachamim said okay fine we understand that you have the uh this wood in the middle but why atse shitim why acacia wood why acacia wood why not i don't know some other wood so rabbi tzadok Cohen, rabbi tzadok Cohen is about 150 years ago lived in 1800s he brings the midrash tanchuma in Parashat Truma, this week's parasha, it says the Shittim wood of the uh, of the uh, Rona Kodesh, the Ark, was in order for us to do tshuva. Meaning that the actual uh, usage of the Shittim wood was a part of Am Yisrael's tshuva, part of Am Yisrael's repentance for the horrendous sin 
that we made in a place called Shittim, meaning the same name as this acacia wood. There was also a place called Shittim. What is this place that was called Shittim? In Parashat Balak. Parashat Balak, where they uh, sent us the uh, the uh, immoral, uh, the, 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 the goyot, and uh, unfortunately we fell for it, and 24,000 of Ami says lives were taken in a massive plague that nearly wiped out the entire nation. If it wasn't for Pinchas, Ben Elazar, Ben Aaron Cohen, doing a zealous act for the sake of Akadosh Baruch Hu, and sacrificing his life and killing the, the main desecrators of Hashem's name, all of Am Yisrael Chas Shalom would have been wiped out. Chas Shalom. So this was, this was done in a place called Chitim, meaning this immoral, this massive orgy of immorality was made in a place called Chitim. So in essence, the Aron Kodesh was one of the ways that we could do tshuva for this particular uh, sin. Furthermore, the, uh, the uh, Rabbi Tzadok Kohen says, also Shittim is connected to the word Shtut. Shtut means uh, stupidity, idiocy. So the Gemara teaches us that uh, in the, uh, a person does not, a normal person does not make a sin unless there's a Ruach Shtut, a spirit of stupidity, a spirit of idiocy enters him. This is in the Gemara, Masechet Sota, page 3.8. So, just like we uh, made a stupid sin because that uh, as a result of our uh, foolish thoughts, we went against Hashem because we followed our desires, not realizing that that would lead eventually not only to an immoral act of Jews and Gentiles being uh, uh, intimate, but also it eventually led to idol worship and a near annihilation, Hashem So, in essence, what the uh, Rabbi Tzadok Kohen says that uh, this atzeh shitim is a uh, this this wood is in essence a reminder of both the capacity, the capacity of how foolish human beings can get to testing Hashem right in front of his eyes, while at the same time showing Hashem's mercy to allow us and to accept our tshuva, to accept our repentance, despite our stupidity. But we have to repent, we have to do tshuva. But why is it in the Arona Kodesh out of all the things in the world? To, to, to symbolize what we mentioned that's in the Gemara in Masechet Sukkah, which is actually in page 52, not 54, that, the, uh, that this particular sin of immorality is not something that only secular people or less religious people are prone to, but rather everyone is. And in fact, the Gemara says this is the main way that the Satan, the Yetzara, tries to seduce Torah scholars with immorality. Because the greater the person, the greater the evil inclination, and the greatest the evil inclination is immorality. And therefore, that's what he tries to catch the Torah scholars with, things of immorality. Now, we also see that, uh, says the Rabbi, Rabbi Tzadok Kohen, that this issue of immorality is not, was not like a one-time plague. It was something that haunted us since the beginning of creation and will be the case until Mashiach comes. Where it even says in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in Genesis that HaKadosh Baruch Hu saw at the time of Noah that the wickedness of man was great upon the uh, earth and that every product of thought of his heart was evil, always. Meaning the natural inclination of a person is to follow his physical desires. And just like the generation of Noah started off by, started deteriorating by uh, corrupting themselves by making immoral crimes covertly, meaning only before Hashem, privately, wasting seed as Zohar Kadosh says, Eventually this led, the verse says, this led to the entire earth becoming corrupt. The entire world uh, being filled with robbery. 
Why? Because that uh, private uh, uh, sin led to a corruption of the neshama, a development of a klipa, and a addiction to sins. And the only way for a person to overcome this natural inclination to follow their desires is to eliminate passivity from their personality. Because a person was created for a positive purpose, but being passive is not always the uh, something that is good. In fact, it's a uh, one of the things that uh, leads people to sins, leads people to uh, leaving a, living a life of sins. Because in order for a person to achieve their greatness, as we heard from Rav Edelstein, a person has to be more initiative, uh, initiate more. But again, the only way for a person to know that their ambition to reach their full potential, in essence, greatness, is going to be the right type of greatness, is by the learning of Musa. Because they have to make sure that they have the moral fortitude to channel their drives in the right direction. And directed towards intense, uh, directed towards uh, Akadosh Baruch Hu in his Torah through learning his to- learning his uh, Torah. And lastly, he says Rabbi Tzadik Akoin that at the time of Mashiach, the prophet Joel, in chapter four, verse eighteen, says that a spring will go out from the house of Hashem and water the val- valley of Shitim. Again, the word Shitim. And this valley of the word Shitim is uh, is alluding to the uh, the uh, the lust that is going to take over the generation before Mashiach, the same type of immorality that uh, almost got us all killed at the time of Moshe Rabbeinu is there at the time before Mashiach. And of course, this is not something I need to elaborate on because everyone that has eyes or ears or or simply exists in the world knows this is the case. Immorality is in essence everywhere that you look. And hopefully, don't look. So how how is the uh, how how do we get out of this situation? So the prophet says that the uh, in the time of Mashiach, in the uh, uh, the prophet Isaiah says, chapter twenty seven, verse thirteen, that uh, at the time of Mashiach, there's going to be uh, on that day a great shofar will be blown for those who are lost in the land of Assyria, and for those who are cast away in the hand of Egypt. And they will prostrate themselves to Hashem in the holy mountain of Jerusalem. So the Chamim explained, namely of Tzaduk Kohen, that these two places, Assyria and Egypt, is not really referring to two uh, places or two nations, but rather two states of mind. Assyria is a place that was a hard to build, hard to make money there. And Egypt was the epitome of ease so much ease and 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 luxury that even the men wore makeup so rabbi tzadok kukoyin says these represent the two main personalities that will exist at the end of days one is going to be those that are chasing the truth but it's going to be hard for them like assyria hard and then there's going to be those that they don't care about anything they just want to Relax and enjoy in this world. They don't want truth. They don't want anything that negates their their own version of the truth. Even if their own version of the truth changes weekly, they care less. They just want to enjoy this world. He says when the uh, Akadosh Baruch Hu decides to give extra messages to the last generation before Mashiach, those people that worked hard in the valleys, overcoming obstacles, looking for the truth, going through the difficulties for the sake of the truth they'll be saved they'll be saved why because they looked for it and therefore when it's there they'll grab it full force and they'll do whatever it takes 
On the other hand, those that are looking for an easy life, just to enjoy this world, they care less about anything that's uh, of, of real value, anything that's beyond just their own current uh, physical addiction. Unfortunately, those people will be wiped out. They're lost. Because they made the wrong choice into their, uh, their uh, life's habit. Now, if we look at the examples that the Gaon Mivilna gave, we'll see why he mentioned these two books. Why did he mention Mishle? Why did he mention Ecclesiastes? When he's referring to these being the best books for Musa. Now, of course, he's referring to learning these books for Musa because he's assuming that the reader understands you have to understand what it means. Therefore, use the commentary of the sages. Now, in these books, you'll see that there is a common element. What's the common element between Mishle and Kohelet, Proverbs and uh, Ecclesiastes? Is that the first verse, Shlomo Melech introduces himself. Second verse, he tells you what's the point of this book. What are you going to learn in this book? And the third is instructions of how to move forward. This is in essence similar to how you have a book today where you have the author, the name of the author, the name of the book. Then uh, perhaps you have a uh, something on the uh, back of the book or in the beginning of the book telling you what the, the basics are of the uh, book are uh, are about the uh, the preface of the book the introduction and then you have the book itself the instructions of what to do but here Shlomo Melech, the wise man of all time doesn't need a whole book to do that he already explains all of those things in three verses meaning what Shlomo Melech did in three verses people usually do in an entire book so in, in the book of uh, proverbs first verse of proverbs Mishle Shlomo ben David Melech Israel. The Proverbs of Shlomo, son of David, king of Israel, meaning, I'm the one that wrote it. That's the first verse of, of Proverbs. Proverbs of Shlomo, son of David, king of Israel. So you know where this is coming from. It's not coming from some homeless guy. It's not coming from some crazy person. It's not coming from some person that doesn't understand. It's coming from Shlomo Amelech, which the Torah itself says, smartest man that ever lived, again, man, is not including, the Gemara says, Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is not really the equivalent of any other man that ever lived. But nonetheless, everybody else. That's the first verse. Second verse, he says, What's the point of this book? In order to make known words of Musa, words of wisdom and discipline. That's the point of the book. To make words of understanding discernible. You need to learn this wisdom and Musa in order to get to a level of understanding. Understanding what? Everything. Understand life, understand Torah, understand the, uh, the, uh, how a Kadosh Baruch Hu operates the world, understand your purpose, understand your success, understand your failure, understand how to overcome understand what the right decision is, which direction to go, why to go, and so on and so forth. Step number three. How do we do it? Lakachat musar eskel tzedek umishpat umesharim. To accept the wise discipline, righteousness, justice, and fairness. So just knowing who the author is and what the book is about is not enough. In fact, not even reading it is enough. You have to accept the wise discipline, righteousness and justice and fairness. Why? To provide simpletons with cleverness, youth with knowledge and design, and the wise one may hear and increase his learning, and a discerning one may acquire strategies. Here Shlomo Melech puts it all in perspective for every single person of why each one of us is obligated to learn Musa. What exactly what the Gaomi Vilna is saying is that this Musa 
is not a suggestion it's not even a recommendation it's life risk why because in order for a person to know how he's going to or she's going to achieve their purpose in their life they have to learn these words of wisdom words of discipline in order for you to understand it but just understanding it is not enough you have to accept it meaning you have to accept this discipline you have to accept this musa you have to accept the justice even if you don't see it as just why because it's a kadosh baruch Hu. it's fairness from a kadosh baruch Hu. and don't think that you've ever graduated learning musa after a year five years ten years why because he's saying this is applicable to everybody whether it's the simpleton or it's the youth or it's the wise one everyone needs to learn this and everyone needs to accept it everyone needs to accept it now out of all the lessons that a person can think okay so what is the wisest man of all time now that he told me who he is that the goal of this book is to teach me Musa and that I have to accept it for my own sake what is the first lesson he's going to start with after this the fear of Hashem is the beginning of knowledge how come he doesn't say love of Hashem how come he doesn't say uh feeling good about yourself everything is good and being united with everyone because if you don't have fear of Hashem you have no dot you have no knowledge yeah but I know a lot of things I know I I learned Talmud I learned this I learned that if you don't have fear of the Almighty on a regular basis your knowledge is null and void Loba Shamaimi as the Gemara says it's not from heaven anyone that does not have fear of the Almighty on a regular basis fear of punishment I'm talking about I'm not talking about fear of the awe of the no fear of punishment because you can have fear of punishment but not fear of his majesty because that's a higher level but you cannot have the awe of Hashem without fear of punishment the fear of punishment in this world and the next has to always exist in every single person at all times a person that does not have fear of punishment at all given times does not have valid knowledge whatever their knowledge is it's not from Shammai it's their own warped mentality why because if you truly understood the magnitude of what the Torah represents that in itself would generate a certain fear because it generates certain responsibility so a person that acts freely and does whatever they want without thinking twice and chooses a different rabbi for for different things based on whoever is going to answer them the right way that's a person that's showing clearly they do not have fear of the Almighty similar to how our friend Goldberg Ephraim Goldberg said that for the inviting the missionary into his synagogue he asked his uh his buddy Rabbi Adelstein we do everything asking Rabbi. I speak to my Rabbi, more of Rabbi of Shechter, I'm very close with other great Rabbanim. Uh, and on this topic, we speak to Rabbi Yitzhak Adlerstein, Rabbi Adlerstein, who's a Muslim of Chavz Chaim, he's a Ben Torah, he's a Tamil Chacham, he's the director of Interfaith at the Center. And I refer you, anyone who's listening, who wants to understand more in depth interfaith issues and the difference between dialogue, which we don't believe in. We don't believe in religious dialogue, we don't believe in religious engagement, religious study, comparative religion. We don't believe in any of that. But cooperation, not only do we believe in, everybody believes in. Rabbi Yitzhak Adlerstein, he asked him, why did he ask him? How come he didn't ask of Shechter? How come he didn't ask Rav Shechter? He said himself, he didn't ask Rav Shechter. He asked uh, Rabbi Adelstein. Rav Shechter said to somebody that uh, he uh, didn't write about, didn't uh, speak to him about it. He didn't, he's neutral. He's not saying no, he's not saying yes. What does that really mean? It means that refer to what he wrote about it nine years ago, which is that he's against it. Ephraim and the rest of his followers, you're all lying to yourself. How are you lying to yourself? You lie to yourself by saying you have rabbis you listen to because you don't listen to them because your own rabbi wrote about this. Rav Shechter writes the following. Apparently, the sanctity of Eretz Yisrael arouses strong feelings of spirituality that one must take care to channel properly. These strong feelings can mislead even the wise to get carried away by their imagination and their desire to be original thinkers and in turn to strengthen Abu Dazara and Shmad. Shmad is destruction. Some rabbis have gained credibility 
by claiming to be disciples of Rav Slovichik, i.e. Efren Goldberg, and then have proceeded to totally misinterpret his views on these issues of Avodah Zarah and Shemad. Now, if you ask Ephraim about the missionary, before today Ephraim will tell you it's a perfectly fine, unifying event. If you ask Rav Shechter, he'll tell you, look at the Shulchan Aruch. It's forbidden according to our Torah. But Ephraim says he asked Rabbi Edelstein. Why Rabbi Edelstein? Because Rabbi Edelstein has been in cahoots with the Christian missionaries for uh, decades already, which we'll get to in a moment. But this is showing a lack of Yat Shemaim. Why? If you're saying that your Rav is Rav Shechter, how dare you go somewhere else for such a big thing? Why do you go to somebody that uh, obviously uh, has a bias? Because you know that Rav Shechter wrote an article about it that's against it. So here we see that fear of the Almighty is not just all of His majesty and how glorifi- glorified He is and how extraordinary He is. Sure, we would all love to get to that point. But Chachamim of Chassidut even teach that that fear of the Almighty cannot exist by itself. There has to always be a fear of punishment, real punishment in this world, the next world, at all times and you can build on that meaning that the fear of punishment in this world can exist without the awe of his majesty the the higher level of fear but the awe cannot exist without the fear of punishment in this world and needless to say love of Hashem cannot exist without those two that we just mentioned without two fears why because the fear of Hashem is the beginning of knowledge now of course you're gonna have somebody who's gonna tell you oh listen <coughs> that's not right that's not this okay so Shlomo Melech says you're an idiot for saying that that's what he's saying what's the, what did he say that continuation of the verse fear of Hashem is the beginning of knowledge foolish ones scorn wisdom and discipline foolish ones so you say that you don't need fear of the Almighty you have a stamp from the smartest man of all time, Shlomo Melech. You are an idiot. Congratulations. Why? That's what it says. Now let's see, maybe, maybe Shlomo Melech changed his mind. Because he wrote Kohelet later. What do you write in Kohelet? First verse. Kohelet. The words of Koelet. Koelet was another name for uh, for Shlomo Melech. The words of Koelet, son of David, king of Yerushalayim. Good. Thank you. We know who wrote it. Second verse. Futility of futility, says Koelet. Futility of futilities, all of futile. That's what the book is about. All of your chasing of honor, money, all physical trade, all the different things that people are chasing to attain, to acquire. Material in this world is all going to be a big waste of time. Why? Because that's not your purpose in life. Sure, we need to work. We need to make a living. We need to do ishtadlut. But the hardest effort needs to be at attaining our, at achieving our purpose in the world which is attained through developing our character traits by learning Torah and Musa now of course in case you didn't get the message he gives you the details what profit does man have for all his labor which he toils beneath the sun so then he starts to give you in essence the same type of message that we got from Proverbs in fact, Rabutai, in Proverbs, the word Musar appears 29 times. Yirat Shemaim, fear of the Almighty, appears 16 times. Punishment appears many, many times in uh, chapter 3, verse 33 or 38. Chapter 5, verse 22, 5, 5 verse 7, 5, uh, 10, verse 2, 10, 24, 29, 21. Many, many times does Shlomo Amelech mention the obligation to fear the Almighty. 
But unfortunately, Rabotai, when a person does not have Yirat Shemaim, it is because they do not learn Musa. Now, sometimes you'll meet people, and I've been uh, fortunate enough to have this tikkun also, where you meet somebody that thinks that they're much smarter than what they really are. Why? What's their, uh, what's their achievement? They own a lot of books. For whatever reason or another, people believe that owning a lot of books makes you smarter. Reading a lot of books that have truth in them, that's what makes you smarter. Owning them doesn't make you smarter. There's a story one time that a uh, rabbi went to visit somebody in, uh, in Europe, I believe it was in uh, England, and uh, this very uh, wealthy guy invited him to the house. He came to the house and he saw a huge, huge library of books. And while he was waiting, he went to go grab one of the books. And the book wouldn't come out. This is strange. And he went to the next book. Tried to grab it, it won't come out. Third book, also, this is, nothing comes out. There's some lock here. And the uh, owner comes, he goes, Rabbi, Rabbi, don't touch my painting. What? It's a painting? He goes, yeah, it's a painting, it's, a, it's imagery, it's a this, it's a that. Why do you have this uh, artwork that's a bunch, looks like 2,000 books, and they're, you know, coming out of the walls? Oh, because it looks good. <laughs> Owning a lot of books looks good. But it only does good if it has truth in them and you read it and sometimes people think oh i own this book yeah 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 no so just because you own the rambam doesn't mean you know rambam in fact even if you read the rambam doesn't mean you know rambam even if you read the gemara doesn't mean you know gemara and I, you have this discussion sometimes with people where you say oh such and such and a shiu and i say rabbi why would you say that i have a gemara in masechet such and such I think it disagrees with what you said. I said, okay, well, what I said is what either that Gemara actually said in the commentaries explained it or what uh, some uh, somebody else said, but it's not my own invention. Unless I specifically say it's my own uh, Chidush. But usually my Chidushim, I double-check them and uh, they never uh, contradict anybody else. That's what makes them a Chidush. So your disagreement is not with me. Your disagreement is with the sages. Your disagreement is with the greatest people that ever lived not with me i just happened to say like a tuki like a like parrot yeah but rabbi but i understand such and such i said okay well you're misunderstanding if you just go to different book you'll understand differently i had this discussion just the other day somebody told me listen i think uh god needs us i said okay i think that uh, you learned a lot of manus friedman uh, lectures he said yeah how'd you know no oh. Because that's, he's the only crazy person that says stuff like that out loud. But no such thing. No such thing as God needing us. It's a, it's, a, it's a heretical statement. God needing anything is a heretical statement. Go read Chovot HaLevavot. First uh, section of the book talks about it. No such thing as God needing anything. You want to go another place? Go to Rambam. His commentary on Perik Chelek. And the Pirush and the Mishnah, beginning, before the commentary in the Mishnah itself starts, talks about how reward, punishment, God doesn't need anything. There are different types of heretics out there that believe all types of warped ideas. You'll find Manus Friedman in there. You'll find Goldberg in there. You'll find those people in there. Rambam speaks exactly about them. Like literally, the only thing you're missing is their names. All the people that we talked about. Uh, Meza, all of those Rishayim are in there. Commentary on Perik Chelek, on the Rambam's Pirush on the Mishnah, for anyone who wants to see. Or you can read the Rambam Shmona Prakim, gives detailed explanation of the 13 principles of faith, which is also in the commentary on the Mishnah. Over there, he explains how there's no such thing as a God needing anything. It's a heretical statement. Okay, let me open the Rambam, he says to me. Okay, great, go open the Rambam. But I read it already. So you read it and you misunderstood maybe. Or you just own it and you believe that you read it because you own it. 
Rabotai, owning books does not make you knowledgeable. Reading them, memorizing them, toiling in them, praying to HaKadosh Baruch to have mercy on you, so you understand them the right way. Before you read every single day, you should ask Hashem, pray to Hashem. Please Hashem, help me. Help me understand. Help me not say something that's pure is impure. Something that's impure is pure. And that my friends will make fun of me. Or that I would make fun of them. Before you read, before you learn every day, you have to make a special prayer. Why? Because learning is not enough. Learning is not enough. You have to get it right. You have to get it right. And the beginning of getting it right is to know you don't know anything. Yeah, but I already learned for 20 years. You still don't know anything. Every day is new. This is part of Musa. But unfortunately, Rabotai, when a person gets too comfortable, they start paskating themselves. They say, we want to be or la goim. We want to be a light to the nations. Bring missionaries to a synagogue. Be friends with them. Now you think I'm mentioning this for no reason? No worry, I'm mentioning it for a reason. Why? Because really the only difference between the right decision and the wrong decision is an Ashkafa decision that requires the learning of Musa in order to arrive at the right Allah. Why do you need Musa in order to arrive at the right Allah? Because when a person learns Musa on a regular basis, they already know that they don't know. Even if they've learned a lot, they can never rely on themselves. And they always have to rely on Gdoleado. Not just the Gdoleado they choose, but real Gdoleado that Amisel has chosen. Namely, the poskim of yesteryear. Such as Rav Moshe Feinstein, Rav Ovadia, Chafetz Chaim, uh, uh, the Baal Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yosef Karo, the giants, and of course the Gaon and all the others. That's what we're talking about. But when a person thinks that they already know enough and they could just simply make a phone call and put the uh, wool over people's eyes, Unfortunately, it's a downward spiral. Our dear friend, Rav Yudah Levin, brought a, uh, a, uh, on a show a psak from Rav Moshe Feinstein. Rav Moshe Feinstein, one of the giants of the previous generation, Paskit, in his responsa in 1967, in two different chuvot, in two different answers, that it's forbidden to have any type of events. Any type of events. Friendly, unfriendly, comity, uh, uh, unity. Any type of events with the idol worshippers, with the Christians. Any type of events. Forbidden. In one, sp- in one answer, in Yoreh Dea, Chele Gimel, Tshuva 43, I... Uh, Answer to a uh, Rabbi Dr. Bernard Lander, where he already had a event planned to go and uh, speak together alongside with some pastors. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein told him, you have to cancel your event. It's forbidden to attend such an event because under all of these types of unity type of events is an ulterior motive of the church where in the past they used violence today they use these types of events for their ulterior motive to convert us to christianity and anyone that attends or supports these types of events of any kind we're not even talking about bringing a missionary to a shul we're talking about anyone a pastor a priest whatever it is any type of events with the church is considered a mesit umediach Israel. You know what a mesit umediach Israel? That's a person that is causing other people to go against the Shem. You know who else is called a mesit umediach Israel and has no share of the world to come? You know who else 
Jesus of Nazareth. He is considered a Mesit Umediach Israel. And that's where he has no share of the world to come. And the Gemara Masechet Gitin says, Jesus of Nazareth is in boiling feces until this until today. And will never come out of there. Because he was a Mesit Umediach Israel. Comes the Rav Moshe Feinstein, one of the giants of all history, and says to Am Israel, don't listen to Adelstein, don't listen to Goldberg, because they don't know what they're talking about. What? The Rav Shechter wrote nine years ago, that was part of the Emet, you're not allowed to do it. But they don't want to ask Rav Shechter. They don't want to read the article, it's available online for free. They actually want to hide it. Why? Because they want to bring the missionary to shul. But what about Rav Moshe Feinstein? Oh, I didn't know. You didn't know and you let a thousand Jews astray. You are Mesitu Mediach Israel. You have to work the rest of your life to hopefully do tshuva. But the Rambam says people like you have a very, very difficult and nearly impossible, nearly impossible time doing tshuva. But if that was not enough, Arab Moshe Feinstein writes another tshuva where he asks Arab Slovachik to sign a letter. Paskining together, forbidding any type of unity events with the church, with the pastors, with the priest of any kind. We're not talking about inviting someone that is a known Christian missionary. We're talking about someone that wants to help Israel. Forbidden. Says Rav Moshe Feinstein. Same thing like the Rambam, same thing like others that we've brought. But no, you want something more recent? You got something more recent. But how do they answer it? They make all types of videos saying, no, we listen to Da Torah. And Adelstein has the audacity to lie to the world in their face. And we're going to show that lie on the little rinky dink video he has on a behind the bima where he tells them we have a red line and we don't cross that red line of course we would never teach the christians torah we don't teach together it's just unity events to help israel within a week within a week this rasha mesitu mediach according to Rav moshe feinstein adelstein goes on a youtube video podcast with a Christian missionary named Robert Stearns. For what? To teach Torah to the Christians. Not for the first time. This, as you see from the video itself, is a repeated offense. He goes on this video, he goes on this podcast, after within the same week telling Ephraim and his buddies, that he doesn't teach the goyim any Torah because it's forbidden to teach them Torah. He goes on there and he teaches them Torah. He goes on there and he teaches them Torah and he calls them my friend. They know each other. Unfortunately, this Stearns, this uh, Robert Stearns, is one of the sneaky ones that has gotten a lot of weak people that are seeking fame fortune and money to go on his podcast to go on his trips and you'll go to his youtube channel and you'll see a whole slew a whole slew of modern orthodox and reform rabbis on his show Ari Lam, a Rabbi Kalman Top, a Rabbi Ari Lam, Rabbi Jonathan Muscat, Rabbi Daniel Kraus, Rabbi Chaim Steinmetz, Rabbi Alex Nazareth, uh, Lazarus uh, Klein, Rabbi Ra- Mark Wildes, the uh, Ephraim's buddy from New York, and on and on and on. Literally, the whole channel is full of rabbis. And who is this Robert Stearns? He's a Christian missionary. But he hides it. He says, no, we're not looking to missionize. We are 
looking to restore to fulfill the prophecy restore Baruch Hashem, I have some friends that used to be very very involved experts within the missionary world experts in the New Testament for the sake of saving Am Yisrael and you say of course he says restoration because that's what he believes he says restoration because that's a trigger word for the evangelical Christians that the Jewish people don't know what it means because restoration means something nice to them but in reality restoration is a two-part process for the return of Jesus according to the Christians one is a physical restoration which is the gathering of the exiles what Robert Stearns focuses on this is why he's so involved with Aliyah and redeeming the land and supporting settlements and part two of the restoration is the spiritual restoration which is a nice way of saying when all of the Jews will accept their Jesus so comes Adelstein one of the 16 wicked rabbis that signed a letter against Rav Mizrahi Sheikh alongside Ephraim Goldberg and a bunch of other Rishayim he comes and he says no no I don't teach the Christians within a week within a week he goes and teaches the Christians and he says I can't wait to see you in September we're gonna learn more who knows how many appointments they have in between and how many other churches he's gonna teach but stupid weak people think it's okay why sounds nice we do everything asking Rebbeim. I speak to my Rabbi, more of a Rabbi of Shechter, very close with other great Rabbanim. Uh, and on this topic, we speak to Rabbi Yitzhak Adlerstein, Rabbi Adlerstein, who is a Muslim of Chavz Chaim, he's a Ben Torah, he's a Tamil Chacham, he's the director of Interfaith Affairs at the Wiesenthal Center. And I refer you, anyone who's listening, who wants to understand more in-depth interfaith issues and the difference between dialogue, which we don't believe in, we don't believe in religious dialogue, we don't believe in religious engagement, religious study, comparative religion, we don't believe in any of that. But cooperation, not only do we believe in, everybody believes in. in the Torah in the Torah camp we don't do classic interfaith dialogue we don't try to see how our different understandings of a text can promote mutual understanding we're not looking to cross pollinate our our understanding with that of others and that's one of the things that by the way keeps put Orthodox Jews and evangelicals together in the golden age of interfaith dialogue there were two groups that sat it out Orthodox Jews and evangelicals the same reason they said, you know, we don't need this stuff. We got we got our own. So at the Wiesendahl Center, we've always stressed multi-faith, not interfaith. Multi-faith mm. means you take different faiths with the passion for religion, for the passion for doing the right thing, and you get them to say, we're not going to talk, we're not going to talk theology at all. We're going to talk about what we can do to, to, to further God's interests in this world. There you are. Hello, sir. It's great to be back with an old friend, if not in Jerusalem, at least through Jerusalem. That's right. Can't wait to see you in September. Oh, thank you, sir. Rabbi, you know, we're we're heading back in September. We can't wait to be there, and, and maybe we can find a way. We would love it if your schedule allows uh, to have you come and greet our group and uh, teach us some, some of the amazing Talmud and Torah that you've learned over all these years. I'd love to do it, and you know I have to acknowledge that uh, there are a lot of people whose heart pushes them to explore this new relationship between Jews and non-Jews. And then, like around chapter line twenty-seven, things switch, and you get to um, not cursing people and uh, bringing your vows in a timely fashion. And then, in line thirty, line thirty of chapter twenty-two, first of chapter twenty-two, you have the first of the many, many laws of kashrut of what you're allowed to eat another mundane activity which becomes very important let me just uh, let me just, uh so kashrut everybody we're, we're all very familiar with the term kosher uh we all know the term kosher uh, but kashrut would be the the kind of um the term that governs all of the kosher laws so kashrut kosher they're very similar linked and rabbi you're saying what i hear you saying is all of these are dealing with property and things that are civil law but all of a sudden it shifts now and it's dealing with 
a food law and what you're ingesting, and that's a personal thing, right, between you and God, what does that have to do with that? So which verse is it? Because our verse 30 says, do the same with your sheep and your cattle, let them stay with their mothers for seven days. Yeah, often we're one verse off. So then for you, it's line 31. In the Torah, in the Torah camp, we don't do classic interfaith dialogue. We don't try to see how our different understandings of a text can promote mutual understanding. We're not looking to cross-pollinate our our understanding with that of others in the Torah, in the Torah camp. We don't do classic interfaith dialogue. We don't try to see how our different understandings of a text can promote mutual understanding. We're not looking to cross-pollinate our, our understanding with that of others in the Torah, in the Torah camp. We don't do classic interfaith dialogue. We don't try to see how our different understandings of a text can promote mutual understanding. We're not looking to cross-pollinate our, our understanding with that of others in the Torah, in the Torah camp. We don't do classic interfaith dialogue. We don't Try to see how our different understandings of a text can promote mutual understanding. We're not looking to cross-pollinate our, our understanding with that of others in the Torah, in the Torah camp. We don't do classic interfaith dialogue. We don't try to see how our different understandings of a text can promote mutual understanding. We're not looking to cross-pollinate our, our understanding with that of others. Keep in mind also that most of this activity goes on in Israel, not, not, not just among Muncie and, and, and Boca. And the law of the land is, like it or not, it's not a Torah state. And, and people are allowed to proselytize for other religions. They can't proselytize to, to people under 16. There's certain restrictions. We would love to see the banning of proselytizing entirely, but it's not Biodeno. It's not It's not for us. In the meantime, the good that can come from that shouldn't be expended by, well, these people hate us. They want to convert us also. We're going to have nothing to do with them. Set up your red line. To us, it's missionizing. We also don't have anything to do and won't have anything to do with Messianic Jews and Messianic Judaism. Now, understand that Bibi Netanyahu's uh, was it the social media advisor, whatever, is a high-ranking person in the 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 a room in the, uh, the in the prime minister's office at least he's a messianic Jew openly a messianic Jew they they they're, they're messianic Jewish whatever you want to call them, synagogues churches whatever throughout the land of Israel they don't they don't disappear overnight we won't have anything to do with them we won't have anything to do with them uh, the Israeli government does that's their choice maybe not the worst choice we the Wiesenthal Center will not have anything to do we don't deal directly with them somebody wants to serve, to, to serve as kind of an intermediary you know, sometimes we'll, we'll we'll welcome their cooperation um, what about somebody who was a messianic Jew or who was a missionary forty years ago thirty five years ago and hasn't done a thing since. And has done a lot of good since then. Well, we're going to be more on the Chashdeu side, but that doesn't that won't prevent us from working with such a person. Rambam writes, can there be a greater stumbling block than Christianity? Can there be a greater stumbling block for Jewish people than Christianity? Um, um, people ask me, how do you minister to Jewish people? And it depends on who you minister to. They're all different. But but, but in, in, in some Messianic circles, they don't want to say cross. So they say tree. And yes, okay, that's fine. But my scripture says it's the power of the cross. It's the power of God to salvation to the Jew first. You're going to bring people to face Christianity in a synagogue? A place where they think that anybody that's speaking must be a kosher person and you're going to bring them the greatest stumbling block that exists in the world? When we had him at Boca Raton Synagogue uh, with Rab Rabbi um, Goldberg, um, we had a great time with him. There's so many things going on. We see the Jubilee year coming. Yes. The mid to years coming. Yes. What does it have to do with Israel? Israel is very important. It's at the center of God's heart. Uh, everything started in Israel. It's now culminating with Israel. I really believe God is about to move. He's moving supernaturally, and God's move has to do with Israel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the glory of the Lord fell. I, I, I was in uh, the church with you when the glory fell several years ago. And the Lord spoke to us. God is pouring out his glory upon the church to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy. Paul said in Romans 9, the glory belongs to Israel. Solomon saw the glory. Uh, um, David cried out for the glory. And I think that it, it, God is pouring out his presence. In other words, we need to listen to the signs and the four blood moons, but this is our greatest hour. In the midst of darkness and deep darkness, arise and shine, for God's glory is about to be poured out upon God's people, and I believe it's going to be a sign to Israel. You see, Israel has Judaism, and so that's a beautiful religion. They don't need religion. They need the reality of a living God who's working in signs, wonders, and miracles. Mm -hmm. Jews yes. ask for a sign. Yes. Mm -hmm. We are living in a convergence. Mm -hmm. God loves Israel. It was God's firstborn. God's covenant with Israel never ceases. I mean, it's an irrevocable covenant that was given by God with uh, the nation of Israel, Jerusalem, as the undivided capital of Israel. And just as God made a covenant with the church, and I think there's a convergence of the Jew and Gentile as the one new man in this day. We're really in the birth pangs of the Messiah. Even the Orthodox community is feeling that the Messiah is coming back soon. And we're feeling those birth pangs as well. But 
as we conclude this segment from South Florida, from the United States of America, joining with our brethren throughout the world, we will not be silent. Yes, but Robert, don't you understand that really this is all just some great theological conspiracy? And don't you understand you just really want all the Jews to convert to Christianity? And don't you understand the hidden motivations? This is really about Armageddon and the apocalyptic vision of the last days. Come on, what's this really all about? How can you be uniting together on anything when this man Jesus separates you so much? Well, it is true that we have significant theological differences between the Jewish and Christian communities. Theological differences that should be respected. As I always do when I speak to Christian audiences, including seminaries, including you know, like classrooms, I say, despite irreconcilable theological differences between us, dot, dot, dot. We have to emphasize that all the time. But they go for it because they understand. Rabotai, this has nothing to do with Sephardi Ashkenazi. It has nothing to do with our minag, their minag. This has to do with an understanding of what the truth is and what Allah is. In fact, the missionaries in the church has hurt the Ashkenazi world much more than it hurt the Sephardi world over the years. And that's why it boggles my mind how the Ashkenazi world is not literally losing their mind that this is happening across the board when your forefathers literally refused to have windows windows set up in a normal way like the rest of the world because it could look like a cross the yeshiva in Volozhin, Rabbi Chaim in Volozhin, the yeshiva that the stipler Gaon prayed in. The rav over there made sure that the windows and the doors are all in an awkward shape or abnormal shape. Why? The normal shape looks like a cross. We don't want our windows to look like crosses. Your forefathers were petrified of the church. Petrified. Why? Because they either killed us physically or spiritually. And these chamolim are bringing the church into the synagogue and saying it's kosher. Rabotai Karim. What's happening today is more dangerous than the Holocaust. Because while the Holocaust killed us physically, this is killing us spiritually. And as I already told you, when it happened, when the event took place, the world is new. And there's going to be major issues happening, and they're already happening. Once the pig became kosher, inviting a missionary became kosher because nobody spoke up, except somebody that's trying to do tshuva, None of the big rabbis, the small rabbis, nobody wanted to speak against it. In fact, other people try to kosher the pig. Oh, I wouldn't do it in my community, but it's okay. That type of mentality brought destruction to Am Yisrael. That United for Israel event kicked off increased anti-Semitism in the United States. Check the news. How much anti-Semitism has increased in the last two weeks since this event? Anti-Semitism always existed, but it increased drastically since this event. You don't want to connect the, the, uh, the events? By all means. You don't have to. But that's your choice to stay blind. Even if you don't want to connect the spiritual to it. If you see that there is a united for Israel, an event supposed to be against anti-Semitism take place right before anti-Semitism increases. At the very least, it shows you that the event is ineffective. And in fact, could be the opposite. If that's not bad enough, look at what's happening in Eretz Israel. Now they're attacking 
the religious community even more. Where now they're trying to get the yeshivot to start bringing in all types of secular subjects, things that our forefathers in the Ashkenazi world fought. The great sages of the Ashkenazi world were not even willing for their yeshivot to teach Russian. Because they said maybe it's going to ruin this kid's brain. He'll start, he'll want to become a businessman instead of a Talmud Chacham. Now the heretics on the other side are saying, no, now you have to. You have to teach more secular studies. You have to bring uh, the, uh, the girls, Bnot Yisrael HaKadoshim, to the mindset that they should go work for technology companies while their husband studies and so on. If your wife's going to work for Facebook and you're going to learn Torah and you think you're, you're imagining that that's going to work out, you, my friend, are very, very sick. Why? The wife of an Avrech is not supposed to go work at a uh, place of Pritzut. But again, the people that hate Musa will reject this, will say this is fanatic, will say this is not connected, I'm just connecting it, and so on, by all means. Everyone is entitled to their opinion. But then there's the facts. The facts are that the greatest Ashkenazi Puskim and Sephardi Puskim forbid these types of events, forbid these types of relationships, forbid them. There is no different opinion. But yet, no one wants to speak against it. Why? Because the answer is clear for those that want to see the answer. If you want to see the answer, you want to see the truth, open a sefer, you'll find the answer. No one can write a tshuva allowing such an event. No one can kasher a pig. But if people are going to continue pretending like they're blind, then we could already understand that we can't trust anybody, we can't rely on anybody, we have to do what the Gemara says, pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and do the best you possibly can to influence yourself in the circle around you, to go in the right direction. It starts with us, learning Musa every day, so we keep our mind spiritually straight, to keep making the right decision. And not make the right decision and then, or then, and then change it to the wrong decision. Because it's not popular anymore. Weak-minded people sometimes make the right decision and then change it to the wrong decision. Why? Sometimes they figure, oh, I tried this, it doesn't work out, I'm going to try something else. Maybe more people are going to like me. When a person really searches for the truth, he's not searching for popularity, he's not searching for like uh, 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 people to like him, he's not searching for anything but to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu to the fullest potential. And serving a Kadosh Baruch Hu to the fullest potential is a life of sacrifice. It hurts, but eventually it's rewarding. That eventually sometimes a day later, a week later, a year later, ten years later, but nonetheless it's rewarding. Now, but I, right now we have a plague. It's a spiritual plague coming from the worlds of idolatry. Our parasha, in last week's parasha, last week's parasha Mishpatim, on the words that HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us, don't even mention the names of these idols. Chachamim say, this is a reminder from Israel to never, never get close and make any types of dealings, commitments, to unite with the idol worshippers, with the nations. Why? We can coexist, but we still have to remain separate. We can be at peace, but not together. We can be friendly, but not friends. Why? Their ideology, 
beliefs are antithetical to ours their belief is that we need to convert to their religion our belief is that there's one and only God and one and only truth those two beliefs cannot coexist in complete peace the Gemara Masechet Megillah says if you tell me that Rome Edom has risen and the Bet Migdash has gone down I'll believe you tell me the Bet Migdash the Torah world has gone up and a dome has gone down I believe you but if you tell me they're both up or they're both down I don't believe you why it's not possible when one is up the other one's down that is a law of nature when one is up the other one is down the problem we have today is that we have people within our own communities that are supposed to be leaders that are bringing it down because they want equality and coexistence and unity with people that for all intents and purposes spiritual enemies of the Jewish people now for those of you who are saying oh yeah but this could create anti-semitism I don't think so I don't think anybody could actually say that anymore because you already you had your United for Israel event and anti-semitism increased I can assure you none of those Nazis on the side of the street and the other Nazis that are in different parks and on the highways I can assure you none of them watch my videos not about Bramnik and not about anything else and even if they did they must have seen other videos where I told them now you know what the truth is we have no problem when Nazis watch our videos because at least they'll know what a real Jew looks like and what they actually say. It's important for us to know the truth in order for us to live it, in order for our children to hold on to it. The great sh- sages in the Ashkenazi and the Sephardi world, in the Hasidish world, in the Litvish world, in the world of Chabad, in the world of, uh, uh, of Breslev, and, and, and everywhere, have fought tooth and nail just to remain Jews. But every generation, there's somebody that's trying to destroy it. Every generation has somebody trying to destroy it, Rabotai. And sometimes those leaders that are trying to destroy it are people that look from sometimes those people look from during the Askala movement the Askala movement had some rabbis in it too aside from the some rich businessmen and things like that they also had some rabbis join them bad rabbis of course these guys wanted to get the uh, interior minister in Russia to pass a law that would force all of the rabbis to teach secular studies specific types of secular studies that could confuse the kids inside their yeshivot the Rebbe of Lubavitch Rav, uh, uh, Shalom Dover of, of Lubavitch and his son, Rav uh, Yosef, Rav Yosef Yitzchak, heard this and knew that uh, something has to be done. So the uh, Rav Yilubavich told his son, go do everything possible to cancel this decree even if that means risking your life even if that means dying just cancel this decree because there's no way that we can bring this foolishness from the enlightenment movement from the reform from the abandoners of Torah into our yeshivot 
But of course, the interior minister is an anti Semite. No less than the self hating Jews that are leading the Enlightenment movement. So you have to do whatever you can to stop this. Rav Yosef Yitzchak prayed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and started thinking, what can I possibly do? And then he thought that he had a friend that was a well-to-do, well-to-do person. And he asked him for help. This was a person that was successful, connected to a lot of people. And uh, he asked him if he could help him. And he says, I can't really help you. I don't have any direct connection to the minister of interior. But let me think about it and see if I come up with anything. A couple days later, he says to him, I have a great idea. I just remembered, I know somebody that used to be a tutor to the minister when he was a kid. Perhaps they still have a connection and uh, he can influence them to cancel this decree. So you bring him to this tutor's house. Tutor is an old man. Happy to see some people. And they start talking. And of course, they're not talking about this thing. You can't just approach this complete stranger asking him for favors on day one. So you start chit-chatting and the old man tutor is impressed with the rabbi. The Chabad rabbi knows Torah, knows the emet, knows the difference between truth and false, and doesn't skip a beat because of who's in front of him. He's not lowering the Torah to anybody's standards. Torah is what the Torah is. You bring people up to it. And the student is impressed by the rabbi. The young man, but smart. And he says to him, I'm an old man. And I haven't met so many smart people like you. Please come visit me anytime you want. And Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak takes advantage of that invitation and starts visiting the old man on a regular basis. And during one of those visits, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak knew that the time is coming for the decision to be made by the interior minister's office. The heads of the Askala, the Enlightenment Movement, have done everything in their power to put this bill, this decree, in his office, and a decision is supposed to be made any day. When he thinks about this, he starts crying hysterical in the tutor's house, and eventually after composing himself, the old man asks him, what's wrong, my dear friend? Why are you crying? And he tells him everything. He says, can you please help me? I heard that you used to be a tutor to the interior minister. The old man looks down and says, I'm really sorry. I don't think I can help you. Not because I don't want to. But because the interior minister is a very evil man. Who does not listen to anybody, even his old tutor, And in fact, just me talking to him, asking him to talk to me, would put my life at risk because he may just kill me just for asking him to talk to me. If Yosef pleads with him to do something, he says, let me think about it. And come back to me in a couple of days. After a couple of days, they meet again. And the tutor says to him, I thought about it. I don't have the strength or the ability to go talk to him. But I do have an idea that may help you. It will put both of our lives at risk. But it's the best I can do. What is it? He says, because I was his tutor, I got a special pass to enter and leave the minister's building whenever I want for life. Now this pass is not something to use nonchalantly. You have to be very careful. 
I'm willing to give it to you, to borrow it, and you can do what you want. But if they catch you with that pass, don't ever mention them that you know me. Don't ever mention how you got it. The rabbi agrees, appreciates it, and takes it. Without skipping a beat, he prays to HaKadosh Baruch to help him make the right decision and heads towards the head minister's office as if he works there. He does some investigation of where and what everything is and he plans to go the very next morning, early in the morning. Just like Avram Avinu, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu asked him to do the Akedah with Yitzchak, says Avram Avinu, come babokir babokir, early, early in the morning. So he gets to the minister's office early in the morning when there's less people, but there's a lot of guards. And as soon as he gets to the gate, one of the guards says, what is a Jew doing here? Without responding, he simply shows him the pass. And of course, the attitude changes. They open a door for him and let him in. And he walks into the minister's huge building. There's guards everywhere, but... He's free and clear. He asks where is the minister's office and finds out it's in the fourth floor. Gets to the fourth floor. And as soon as he gets there, he sees that there is some very well-to-do person. Gets out of the office at the end of the hall and walks in a different direction. He didn't need to guess, but he knew that that's the minister himself. Immediately, he runs to that office because he knows that time is limited before that minister comes back. He gets to the desk and he sees that there are two piles of paper. One pile are documents that the minister already reviewed of different bills and decrees that he approved and one pile is the ones that he rejected and then there's a third pile of what he's reviewing that's in front of him quickly he goes through the papers to try to find the paper from the enemy the reformers the enlightenment movement the Ascala, the self-hating jews some of which were rabbis. After a few moments, in Dishmaya, he finds the paper, stamps it with the not approved, puts it in the right pile, and leaves as if he never existed. Leaves the building, returns the pass, thanks the tutor, and celebrates with the rest of Am Yisrael, when the news gets spread that the minister rejected the decree the leaders of the Askala movement are surprised because they knew that he hated Jews and they had no idea why he would reject such a bill but there was nothing that they can do in every generation there are some wicked people that try to destroy us Sometimes it's Haman from the outside, sometimes it's a Haman from the inside. The Prophet says, Your conquerors, your destroyers, the worst type, are going to be from within you. Goliath was a Jew. Nebuchadnezzar was a Jew. Some of the worst people against Am Yisrael were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. Shabtai Tzvi was a Jew. All of these Reshaim had some type of help from people that looked kosher. Some people that acted kosher. The way to decipher what's kosher and what's not kosher is to go to Mishle. Go to Kohelet. Go to Moshe Rabbeinu. Go to the Alakha, to the Moshe Rabbeinu of the generation, and double and triple check 
not just what the question is, but that you're asking it the right way. Because you could have the right question, but your bias would cause you to ask the question the wrong way. If you're going to go to the right source on a daily basis, by learning Musal, by training your own neshama to stay on a straight path of truth, the truth will come out of you naturally. Be'ezot Hashem, this too will help some people that have gone astray. Whether it's Goldberg and Adelstein or their cohorts or their followers or their friends or their supporters or other people. Be'ezot Hashem will show you that you still can do tshuva and stop being a mesitu mediach because your own poskim, our own poskim, everybody's poskim are saying what the truth is and it's not with you currently. Ba'uch Adonai Le'olam Amen v'amen.
אני מברך, אני מברך את הרבנים, רגע, 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 אני מברך את הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שהלכו בפיוניון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא משאלות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל אשר יפנו, ישכילו ויצליחו, יזכו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולמה של תורה. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. פלורידה, איפה זה פלורידה? באמריקה. כן, ליד. אנחנו שם עכשיו הולכים להקים קהילה ספרדית. חזק אותו בשביל. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. תעביר לו מה שבירכתי אותו. כן, קהילה ספרדית גדולה.